I want to talk about a goofy movie. A Goofy Movie is an animated musical released by Walt Disney Studios in 1995. Set in the same universe as the Disney Afternoon show Goof Troop, it tells a father-son bonding story about Goofy and his son Max, now a teenager in high school. In an attempt to grow closer to him after receiving some very one-sided news from his principal before school let out for the summer, Goofy takes Max on a road trip across the United States to fish at the same lake his father took him to as a child. This ruins his Max's plans to attend a house party with his newly acquired date Roxanne to view the Powerline concert, who he reflexively tells her is the reason he has to cancel their date, and is given the opportunity to change the destination of the trip to the concert in LA. And with that trajectory comes a story about bonding, trust, and communication. I've grown up! I've got my own life now! I know that! I just wanted to be part of it! While its resources were limited in comparison to other animated titles from the studio when it was being made, and didn't receive that much love in theaters, the home video release for a Goofy movie was where the movie found most of its love and appreciation, quickly becoming a cult classic to millennial 90s kids. Now there is a possibility that some of you out there only believe our need to claim a Goofy movie is thanks to Powerline, which I completely understand. He's a dark-skinned pop sensation voiced by Tevin Campbell, famously known for the R&B bop Can We Talk? the same one whose lyrics are pretty much embedded in all of our DNA at this point. And his real life inspiration are three famous black pop stars, specifically Michael Jackson, Prince, and Bobby Brown. But outside of Powerline being the first time we see a prominent dark-skinned goof-related character in the Goof Troop franchise, there's more to why black millennials are so quick to claim a Goofy movie for themselves that reaches subconscious levels. It's Max and how he goes out of his way to impress Roxanne. It's seeing the differences in how Pete raises PJ versus Goofy raises Max. And it's also in seeing Goofy and Max's lack of communication being the result of pretty much most of their strife over the course of the movie, hitting so close to home with a lot of black 90s kids who watched this movie for the first time in 1995. What is meant to be a universal story about child and parental bonding for every color and creed ended up having so much subtext in this story that we black millennials pretty much claimed a Goofy movie as our own the more that some of us picked up on it. And while I can't speak for everyone, the most I can do is speak for why those aforementioned moments of a Goofy movie spoke to my black millennial self growing up now that I'm capable of reflecting on these emotions with a better sense of maturity. But in order for me to do that, I must first acknowledge the efforts made by a certain member of a generation that put in the time to make a Goofy movie such a staple for millennials in the first place. Chris Matheson helped write a Goofy movie, who was also the co-writer of the Bill and Ted trilogy, along with Ed Solomon. Because of that, a lot of the themes revolving around Max reflected that of the parents just don't understand aspect of early Gen X, with him being a Gen Xer himself. But because the movie was released in 1995 and Matheson put in the work, the Gen X angles and tropes that you think would be present in the movie were instead substituted with elements a lot of us millennials experienced growing up in the 90s in one way or another. Yo, Stacy! Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me, baby! Now, as someone who has watched media written by and made for Gen X, while there's a tad bit of evergreen relatability and aspects of it that future generations can possibly relate to, there's definitely a degree of separation depending on what's going on in the media. 
And that's because with every new generation, the transferable experiences from previous generations become more and more questionable. What might have helped members of Gen X feel noticed and empowered might leave future generations with questions and concerns about how they view society. And this is mostly because empathy and evaluation becomes more and more prominent with certain individuals who digest movies, television, books, and whatnot with each passage generation. That would explain why some Gen Xers can look at Bender's actions in The Breakfast Club as rebellious and unconforming, but most millennials and Zoomers just see an asshole bully based on his actions over the course of the movie. Why some Gen Xers supported Ferris Bueller talking Cameron into spending the day hanging out with him and his girlfriend across downtown Chicago despite being actually sick while some millennials and Zoomers thought that considering everything Ferris was asking of him, that he was being a shitty manipulative friend. Why some Gen Xers didn't really see a problem with Sandra Dee's transformation at the end of Greece, while some of us millennials and those who are Zoomers only saw someone who already liked themselves as they were until they met a specific crowd of individuals, being willing to change aspects about themselves just to both fit in with them and win the attention of a man, who was already going to do the same thing for her, but immediately reverted to his default when he saw that Sandra already Already put in the work. Tell me about it. Stop. This type of generational gap in media for certain generations is pretty constant depending on where individuals range in the time frame of their current generation. Sometimes you as a millennial child of the 90s and teen of the 2000s luck out and get exposed to content that's both aimed at your demographic and written by individuals in or understand your demographic. But most of the time, the content you experience is literally the secondhand smoke of the generation that came before you. Then, when it's our turn to create mainstream content, we subconsciously do the same thing. We create shows, books, and television shows aimed for younger generations, but they're either our stories or the stories we always wanted to see when we were their age, but couldn't because they were written by individuals who never experienced it. That's why Euphoria. No, that's it. That's the whole sentence. Thankfully, in the case of a Goofy movie, millennial children who grew up in the 90s had Chris Matheson, a Gen X writer who not only grew as a screenwriter as he advanced in his career with the popularity of Bill and Ted, but also learned, adapted, and aimed to better understand the voices of the generations that came after him in order to properly tell stories that they can relate to and learn from. To paint a better picture, both he and his Bill and Ted co-writer, Ed Solomon, had both Bill and Ted say a homophobic slur in both Excellent Adventure and Bogus Journey. While it was a widely used insult in a lot of PG-rated films in the late 80s featuring kids and teens, I'm looking at you, Monster Squad, both he and Solomon regretted adding it in the first two movies and made sure Face the Music, the third installment of the Bill and Ted trilogy, would do right in applying the change behavior to both Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter's relief. Now, while some would be absolutely justified in saying that such a decision is minuscule in comparison, others like myself can see this decision in at least the progression of Matheson's writing career over the course of the 31 years since Excellent Journey play out in how he was willing to expose himself to the changing times of the 90s in order to better reflect the generation a goofy movie aimed to reach for. And while Disney initially contracted Jim Matheson one of the OG writers of Goof Troop, to write the script, you can see that Matheson's hand in how he grew in storytelling and being adaptable for younger audiences helped in delivering the reasoning behind why it's such a hit with millennials, specifically millennials of color. While, yes, the connection between parent and child getting them to better understand each other was a driving force for millennials overall, it's the small things and story beats that black children at the time both consciously and subconsciously experienced that made a Goofy movie such a unique experience for them. 
Because while there are key factors into how the story progresses, for a lot of us black folk who watched the movie as children, the touches that were made to give the scenario's uniqueness subconsciously hit us heavily in the relatability department. Both the good, the bad, and somewhere in between. So let's start with somewhere in between. Now, I don't know about you, but a lot of the schools that I attended being a black kid living in the city of Detroit were underfunded thanks to things such as the after effects of redlining. I covered the old racist practice in my video essay on the first Candyman movie, but for a refresher, it's the systematic denial of multiple services to the residents of specific neighborhoods. It was, and still is real talk, a way of denying loans and government funding to people of color, poor white folk, and the neighborhoods they resided in by going not by race and creed to avoid civil rights discrimination, but by city districts and neighborhoods that were listed as hazardous or in the red. At least on the side of the individual, this practice shifted from going by red line maps to personal credit scores once the government started cracking down on these discriminatory actions that separated predominantly middle-class white folks placing themselves and gaining proper funding in their suburban neighborhoods to invest in better school systems and extracurricular activities while the practice kept people of color in underfunded urban areas and from building generational wealth on their own. Nevertheless, despite putting an end to said practice, the damage was already done, and the effects it left in sectors such as the difference in public and private schools can still be felt well into the 21st century. Being a child and a teen growing up in the city of Detroit, only having the Detroit public school system at your disposal throughout your tenure as a student, the closest thing you could get to having a similar experience as those who attended properly funded white suburban high schools was if you made it into one of the three prestigious high schools in the Detroit public school system via testing or audition. Lewis Cass Technical High School, the school that I attended, Martin Luther King Jr. High School, or Renaissance High School. Now, I was in elementary school when a Goofy movie was released in theaters, about to finish first grade more specifically, so I didn't really feel the result of these situations that the public school system of Detroit had to deal with until I was much older. I might have always had an old slash mature soul about me, but I think it's fair to say that at six years old, to about to turn seven, my soul was probably around 24, 25 at the time. <laughs> and despite me not having Disney Channel growing up and my only exposure to goof troops strictly being Disney afternoon blocks on ABC and CBS, the only thing I mainly related to Teenage Max in a Goofy movie at the time was his willingness to impress Roxanne, because I was a kid with a crush on a girl in my class and only had Doug Funny's anxious ass to help me learn how to deal with it. Then, as I got older, I gained more experience in my blackness being an inner city black kid in the 90s. I think I grinded for that experience for like five hours straight, mostly because my mom wouldn't let me constantly run in and out of the house. I became wiser and more mindful of my surroundings and situations. I saw the differences in the field trips I used to go on being in DPS versus the ones my white suburban counterparts did. I saw the differences in our school plays, the fact that we had fundraisers involving selling cookie dough from Little Caesars while they barely ever had one just so we could afford to have the same Scholastic Book Fair. That's why in regards to my rewatches of a Goofy movie on home video as I grew older, I was less invested in what Max did to impress Roxanne and more invested in how he had the tools to be able to pull it off. Because let's just be honest readers, as black folk, specifically black millennial adolescents, hijacking the last assembly of the school year with your AV club friends just to perform the latest single of a 90s pop star for your high school crush isn't one of the things that we'd actively decide to do. And that's partly due to the fact that some of us never had an AV club. <laughs> 
But also thanks to how hand-in-hand -hand black millennial youth was with the parental discipline of acting a fool, we never really entertained the ideal of doing it in the first place, especially if we didn't have teachers that knew the importance of their students being allowed to express themselves. And that theory is shot down to the ground even further once you take into consideration the long-lasting effects of redlining that kept said funding from even being considered in most public school systems within previously red and yellow areas. And then you also have to remember that this takes place in the mid-90s, when predominantly black schools across the country decided to save money by cutting budgets in their programs for the arts, thanks to the at-the-time modern-day result of the same discriminatory actions of the past. That's why for a lot of black youth who timely watched and grew up with this, the first act of a goofy movie is a power fantasy. A way of allowing us a way of doing things otherwise impossible by living vicariously through a character that has the means to accomplish such expressions via proper school funding and doesn't have to worry about being disciplined by their school or their parents from the decisions they make because it's not there. And the fact that the decision was made with something already black-coded in the universe of the story helps with the immersion. Because if any black kid did what Max did in real life, proper funding or not, we all know that we wouldn't be Max in this situation. We'd be PJ. And speaking of how to not raise your kids... Even during the days of Goof Troop, Pete and PJ's relationship was never the blueprint. And while it was played up for laughs when it was used as a device to show off PJ's worried and timid demeanor on the show, a Goofy movie answered the age-old question about how abusive of a father Pete truly was to his son. If Max hijacking the end of the year assembly to put on a faux Powerline concert for Roxanne is the power fantasy, then for black millennials who are brought up during the time of a Goofy movie, PJ's reaction to the principal informing Pete of the part he played in the matter is not even the tip of the reality iceberg we'd face if a lot of our parents or grandparents found out. Oh man. My dad is gonna smash me like a bug! There's a reason why a lot of us look at situations that either younger generations or non-black individuals find themselves in, shake our heads and go, my mama slash daddy would have beat the black off me if I ever did something like that. Because depending on the parent, Pete's under your thumb way of initiating discipline in the household is the only way they know how to do it. And in thinking it establishes respect because that's how they were raised and they turned out fine, there's a chance it actually establishes fear. I honestly can't count on one hand alone how many times I didn't want to tell my mom something growing up because I was afraid of how she'd react to it, and I'm not even counting the times that I actually received whoopings. And even though they are preaching things true, especially nowadays, getting those heated ass talk downs about how we as black folk can't be casually doing what we see white folk do, and how we have to be twice as good to get half of what they have, always done in the tone to make us feel like shit just for trying to live, by the way always tended to drive home the fear of having to come to them for anything, because you know how mama and daddy gonna react. You can't talk to them about anything. Pete's parenting might not have completely reflected these problems a lot of black millennials had in discussing things that resulted in that way, but Pete's ideals and how PJ reacted to said ideals every time we saw them on screen, both separately and together, was enough of a comparison for those of us who grew up in those types of households to realize the similarities. And it's even more disheartening when you see that PJ not only is naturally respectful of those older than him... Here you go, kids. I want to go check out the hot tub. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, all right. But also naturally seeks out the respect of his father, most of the time to no avail. 
But not everything regarding the way Pete treats PJ in a Goofy movie is a projection of relatability with the black fan base the movie gained over the years. Because while the abuse he suffers PJ through over the course of it is psychological rather than physical, the under your thumb mindset Pete has is very reminiscent of generations of black parents who believed in whooping their kids, especially under the excuse of Christianity. Only Pete's phrase is a replacement of the more popular phrase, spare the rod, spoil the child. If we are to assign allegories here, Pete and his opinions regarding the place of children is very reflective of what a lot of Christian fundamentalist pastors preach to their congregations, that children are naturally prone to lying and manipulation and must be taught their place sooner than later. This mentality is what runs through Pete's mind when it comes to how he feels he's raising PJ and his overall opinions regarding Max's upbringing. Because according to the saying, spare the rod, spoil the child, it leaves us believing that an unruly or spoiled child, one who is a threat to family, community, and society, lives in a house where no hitting is allowed. Or in the case of a Goofy movie, no psychological abuse. To Pete, the house where no hitting is allowed is Goof's house, and the spoiled child in this case is Max. And while he's doing nothing but perpetuating the cycle of violence and abuse probably brought on by his dad when he passes his said discipline on to PJ, he sees his child's fear as respect you know, maybe Max isn't all the things that you think a son should be, but he loves me. Hey, my son respects me. Yeah. Disregards any attempt PJ makes to impress him enough in order to truly gain it. Is PJ here? Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he's loafing around here somewhere. And treats any attempt made to have a healthy connection with him as a joke, because children are innately devilish, liars, and manipulators. Well, I heard the little mutant telling PJ that he changed the map, so you're heading straight to LA, pal. This is why Goofy's take at parenting Max leaves Pete so confused whenever he witnesses the differences. You really had him fooled, Pete. Me? You jumped out of your skin. Uh oh, I was just pretending for your sake. All right, sure. Did too. Did not. <laughs> Gives Pete a bit of a superiority complex when said differences give him the opportunity to either gloat about the psychological trauma he puts PJ under or gives him the opportunity to tell Goofy, I told you so regarding Max. Max. Check the map, goof. And makes him insecure about what he's been brought up to be true whenever he sees Goofy and Max defy it with the actual intention behind the phrase, spare the rod, spoil the child. What do I mean by the actual intention? Well, while those of us who are brought up Christian know the phrase thanks to Proverbs 13.24, he who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him, this verse is most of the time paired with other verses in Proverbs regarding corporal punishment for adults. The actual context for the verse is found by actually applying proper Hebrew terminology to it, such as the Hebrew word for rod being shebet, a shepherd's crook, used for guidance and protecting sheep from wolves, and has since been used as a symbol for leadership, wisdom, and the aforementioned guidance and protection. Because people under the Christian faith associate the rod to punishment, thanks to verses like, a rod is for the back of one who lacks common sense, Proverbs 10, 13, or a whip is for a horse, a bridle is for a donkey, and a rod for the back of fools, Proverbs 26, 3. We take Proverbs 13, 24, and the saying at birth by 17th century poet Samuel Butler out of context. The rod, in its proper context, represents leadership, wisdom, guidance, and protection. And if we spare it, the child in question will be overindulged in the wrong things. 
And while all of this can easily be applied and relatable to individuals of other ethnicities, this is a subconscious factor in a good amount of black millennials who had parents along these lines. I wouldn't be surprised if there were some who attached themselves to the implied trauma as much as there were people who attached themselves to the expression fantasy and overall vibes. However, it's important to note that just because Pete represents the widely misinterpreted take on how most of us were disciplined, that doesn't mean Goofy was a follower of the true iteration of the phrase from Jump. Just like Max, Goofy made a choice. And from what I've experienced growing up, it's a choice a lot of our parents made all too well. None of the events of a Goofy movie after Goofy received the phone call from the principal would have happened if he simply sat down with Max and talked about what actually happened and why he did what he did. Instead, Goofy let the hysterical words of an adult of his generation worry him into making the spontaneous decision of the two going on a long road trip to go fishing fueled by his own worry that his son was going down a dark path. I seriously reevaluate the way you're raising your child before he ends up in the electric chair. And every time Goofy hinted at said words to Max upon arriving home, no form of communication was made between the two regarding understanding the bigger picture. Why are you doing this to me, Dad? Because I don't want you to end up in the electric chair. <laughs> electric chair what and by the time the two of them did actually talk about what happened that resulted in goofy forcing max on this trip so much happened that both simultaneously healed and hindered their relationship that all there was left to do was talk what goofy and max experienced over the course of a goofy movie was the theory of intersectionality specifically intersectionality applied to individuals of different generations but of the same community now traditionally the theory is used to show the disadvantages people have that overlap with each other thanks to oppression race, gender, sexual orientation, things like that. But it can also be used to see a disconnect in members of different generations as well. Goofy and Max are actually pretty decent examples here. Despite being a goof and afraid of being more and more like his dad as he gets older, Max is bold, daring, willing to do big things to and forgive the pun, stand out above the crowd to impress people he likes, something that his dad Goofy doesn't really understand until the end of the movie. Well, I think the only thing for us to do now is to get you up on stage with this power line feller. <laughs> And why doesn't Goofy understand it sooner? Because thanks to receiving a fraction of the whole picture from the high school principal, an important authority figure of the school belonging to the same generation as him with his own limited perception of the younger generation he oversees, the over-exaggerated actions of Max are immediately translated to him as red flags, and no attempt at trying to understand the bigger picture is made. So because it was a way that made sense to him, Goofy initiates a road trip in order for the two to bond, just like his dad did with him. In the case of trying to bond with his son, Goofy is allowing his own personal lived experiences to get in the way of seeing Max's own experiences and complex identities that were manifested in ways that resulted in this happening thus making it difficult for Goofy to connect with Max over the course of their trip. And it happens in multiple ways. The fight over the radio, the secondhand embarrassment Goofy delivers to Max at Lester's Possum Park. Goofy doesn't really make any real attempt to put the picture Max's principal painted for him aside and get to the bottom of what's going on with him that prompted said phone call to begin with, until they're both using the car as a white water raft, until there's literally nothing left to do but talk. 
Because he isn't given the opportunity to understand why all of this was necessary, or even explain the reason for his actions after trust was formed between them with Goofy's passing down of the map, Max experiences a form of discrimination among an individual of his community, or family in this case, at a different generational stage than him. While it's easy to apply this aspect of intersectionality theory to people of color in the workplace and whatnot, in order to better understand how porcelain people use our overlapping layers of identity for the purpose of discrimination, it's just as important to take this theory and apply it to why our parents were so slow to hear our side of things whenever we got in trouble, or add another factor outside of the fear of extreme discipline as to why we were so slow to communicate with our parents in order to break the cycle because how it applied to the members of the household that made it so hard for us to talk to anyone that wasn't 15 plus years older than us and as I stated before, despite multiple people being able to relate to this experience, this is something that can be 100% understood and relatable to black millennials who felt the pressure of growing up being as pleasant, hardworking, and unthreatening as possible in order to thrive in a world that, while still mirrors the one your parents did grow up in, is making strides and getting better in ways to allow yourself your freedom of expression as much as it allows your white counterparts. Especially when, despite them aiming to make sure we had access to bigger and better than they did, said parents are still influenced by the times they themselves were brought up in. All that to say that I don't think they're gonna be sneaking us into a Powerline concert anytime soon, but there's hope for us to be that parent for our children if we don't repeat the same mistakes. Boy, this has been one crazy vacation. And it's not over yet. For a movie that wasn't given the same amount of time and dedication from its studio as its bigger projects, but was still given so much time, care, and dedication from its creative team as it did, it's both simultaneously surprising and unsurprising knowing that a Goofy movie was such a unanimous sleeper hit with a whole generation of people. And to make things more shocking, seeing that said creative team utilize what they assumed were very universal aspects of growing up and struggling to find common ground with parents in ways that both spoke to and resonated with the experiences of a whole ethnicity within that generation to the point where they possibly looked at what was being presented, pointed at the theater or television screen, and said, this is my life. Because like I said in this essay, time and time again, many millennials of multiple ethnicities relate to a Goofy movie in multiple ways. But there is a reason why black folk of said generation hold it so near and dear to the point where we constantly expect it to show up at the cookout without a proper invitation. And while my experiences that I've explained in this video with how a Goofy movie connected with my sense of blackness may be different than yours, the fact that there's another black millennial that's watching this right now that can recollect how the movie specifically connected with theirs just highlights the very power this film has in giving us a sense of unity. And if that's not a way to see things eye to eye, then I don't know what is.